welcome and we're so glad that you have joined us. Let me ask you a question. Are you living for Jesus? Or if you're not, you ever wonder, how do you live for Jesus? And maybe you, you're already saved and maybe you're thinking about, how do I live for Christ? And what does the Lord really want from me? Well, we're going to look at that uh, in this message and it is entitled, How to Live for Jesus. And it's based on Psalm chapter 40, one of my very favorite psalms in the Bible because of the first part, because the psalmist there found himself in one of the horrible pits of his life, and he had a lot, a lot of them. And sometimes we find ourselves there, but we look at the delivering power of God and what faith in God will do and trust in the Lord and prayer, all of these things will do. And th these are all found in Psalm 40. So we're gonna look at this in the New King James Version. And there he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. This is the work of God. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. In verse 4, blessed is that man, woman, boy, or girl, that person who makes the Lord his or her trust and does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Skipping down to verse 6, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. An amazing passage of scripture. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your grace toward us. It is a privilege and joy to look into the word of God. That is how we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. That is one of the ways, and we, we do what the Bible says, is to let the word of Christ dwell richly in our hearts. And we thank you, God, for helping us to, to have a sense of direction and purpose in life, that we can look at your word, see your will, and it would take us in a, a, a direction that would bring blessings and be a blessing. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If someone were to ask you, if you would really like to live for Jesus, how would you reply? Well, I'm just not ready to do that yet, or that's what I'm already doing, or I want to learn more about that. Well, for everybody who's striving to live for Christ, of course, we would say yes, even if that is an unasked question every day. In Psalm 40, the writer of this psalm was describing a time in his life when life and circumstances just to seem to be completely and overwhelming uh, just uh, against him. Listen, but look at this. Yet even though he was feeling overwhelmed and overwhelmed and very stressed, we see here that he is living for the Lord. How do you know that? Because first of all, he is a praying man. He manages his troubles and even life's horrible pits through the prayer of faith. That is, if you can learn how to do that, it will help you tremendously in the difficult times. That is how you learn to rest in the Lord when everything else uh, it is just not working right. And when Ruth Graham was talking about Psalm 40, uh, she said this, I think basically what is meant by the term Christ-like has got, the, got a lot to do, or has got to do with the attitude of, of Christ toward his Father's will. Let me ask you a question. What is your attitude toward the will of God for your life? Are you living it out? Or are you half living it out? I think the Bible calls that lukewarm, and that is not a good position to be in. Or are you just ignoring it completely? Well, that's important. Uh, and, and, and in Psalm 40, this psalm not only applied to David in this, this king of Israel who was having a horrific time in his life, some of the problems he caused himself and others just were what they were, yet uh, in spite of everything, uh, he still trusted God. 
And it's almost written, it seems to be written also of Christ, where it, where it says in Psalm 40, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Nobody did that better than Jesus. And if you want to do it, live out the will of God better, look at Jesus and learn from him. Listen and read to what he preached and taught and then follow the example he set. The Apostle Paul talking about the example of Christ. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So that's the solution. So how do you live for Jesus? First of all, we must have ears that hear the Word of God. And in Psalm 40 verse 6, part of that verse says, My ears you have opened. And in the Amplified Bible, you have given me the capacity to hear and obey your law, a more valuable service than burnt offerings and sin offerings, which you do not require. God would much rather have somebody living for him than to, instead of that, like in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law, where they would offer up animal sacrifices in the process. Now, this is, listen, this opening our ears to be able to hear and respond in faith or obey the will of God, walk in obedience to the will of God. That is the ongoing work of Christ in our lives. It doesn't take place all at one time. When you get saved, that's just a starting place and God expects you to grow beyond that point. And you grow, um, right now we're, we're, our first church service will be uh, Sunday, June 7th, just from Sunday morning at 11 o'clock observing the uh, coronavirus guidelines. Now, but you need to be in the church or either thank God for all the people who listen to, to church ministries now or sermons more than we ever have. And for every, I would, we do appreciate all the people who, who, who listen to or participate in all the ministries that we're now doing um, in different ways. Um, the preaching messages that I do are on Sunday morning at 11 and Wednesday at 7. On Monday night, we do a, a conference phone call that's led by a minister in our church, Sister Vinnie Golden. And on Sunday night, uh, there's a great ministry there uh, that starting right on Sunday night, hipping your week, get going in the right direction with BJ and Leslie Piles on Facebook as well. Uh, and then also, uh, we do something called Elevated 8 on Thursday night, which is like a Zoom meeting, but we're actually now beginning to look at Skype. We think that might be a little easier to use. But we're doing all these different ministries. We, we appreciate all people who watch any of these or all of these or who participate. I'm so glad you're watching this. So we talk about growing in the Lord. That's how you grow in the Lord. And, and, and in His work, it, it, is, it is the Lord's work within us. Uh, and, and it's not something we can do or, or would do without the Lord's work. If people get saved, Jesus said it's only when the, the, the Holy Spirit draws that person, brings that person to a, a saving knowledge of Christ, uh, when we begin to see our, the Spirit of God helps us to see our sins as God sees them, not as we see them. We paint them in different pictures. The world paints uh, sin as something to be uh, uh, enjoyed. And, and something that, that you should desire, which is all a lie. The end of sin is death always. All kinds of different ways it's death. Now in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, the New King James Version, but by the grace I, of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. That, those are the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, I know. That, that I look what God has blessed me to be able to do, but it wasn't me, it was the Lord working through me. And, I, I, and, and that's the process that takes place. Not only that, if you're going to live for the Lord, you have to offer a life that is available to God. Let me ask you a question. How available is your life to the Lord? It depends on who you're living for. And, and in Psalm 40, verses 6 and 7, and... and sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you've opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written on me. 
Sounds like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 when he's said to the Lord, when the Lord asked, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, or here am I, send me. That's the way it works. Someone said the greatest ability God can use is availability. How available are, to, are you to, for the use and glory of God? In the, in the contemporary English version, Psalm 40 verse 7 says, and, and so I said, I have come to do what is written about me in the book where it says, I take joy in doing your will, my God. If you're really going to walk with the Lord, you have to learn to take joy in doing the will of God. It's not always what you would like to do. As a matter of fact, sometimes it will be the opposite of what you would prefer to do. But this is the attitude that Jesus showed us when he lived out his life obeying and serving God. You know, he came as, as prophets that were, about, you know, just as the prophets of the Old Testament had prophesied about him, beginning in the book of Genesis and, and, and ending in the book of Malachi, the first and last books of the Old Testament. And then he shows up in Matthew 1, the first book in the New Testament. Now, um, and, and, and he lived out the will of God. This, and, but you know what? The Bible talks about all of us who also were predestined to walk basically and follow the example of Christ in the will of God. That is God's plan for every child of God. And, and, and when you get saved, that's God's will for your life. Not only that, we must have a heart that's open to God's will. Wherever your heart is, and that, that tells a lot about who you are and where your priorities are and exactly what you love and, and, and what, what really uh, delights you. In Psalm 40 verse 8, the New King James Version, which is quoted again in Hebrews 10, 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Not just willing to do the will of God, Jonah got willing to do the will of God in the Old Testament when God had commanded him, it was not optional, it was not a discussion, it was not like, let's, let's, just, let's just talk this out. But God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them in 40 days everything's going to be destroyed there, all the people in the city. Jonah didn't want to do that, but after three days and nights in the belly of a great fish, he got very willing. But he still didn't delight in it, and he really, that's an odd book in the Bible, it ends with Jonah still having a terrible attitude about it all, even though he was one of the most successful evangelists in the Bible. The whole city repented. 120,000 people. Simon Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and, and it was 3,000 people that got saved. This whole city repented when Jonah went through it and preached just a basic message and he never wanted to do that. He didn't want to do the will of God there. Listen, there, there are these different words that we think about. Sacrifice is one in this passage is of Scripture that we're reading. Offering is another. Burn offering is another. And sin offering is another one. And, and these all embrace this idea of, of sacrifices and offerings that was known uh, among the Hebrews. And the idea here is that these offerings is what they were accustomed to offer and that was required of these people. Now God is looking a lot more from you than a ritual offering. You can offer up something and your heart still not be right to God. But if you'll tithe, we're grateful, okay? Even if your heart's not right with the Lord. He's, God sees your heart. He sees my heart. He sees your heart. Your heart is open to the Lord. And, and yet, how open and available our heart is to God is really what counts here. When, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, part of that prayer was, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray sometimes, thy will be done in my life, and thy kingdom be done in my life, just like it is in heaven. It's not always, and it won't always be done in your life, even if that's a, a goal. Because our flesh, our human nature is fallen. And, and it takes a revived spiritual nature to overcome that. And it is an ongoing battle. Or if it's not for you, good for you. I think for a lot of us it is. Now, uh, God sees your heart. And you know, like 
letting your, how do you let your will be done in God's will? If you merge from a highway onto an interstate, you go down the ramp to merge with traffic, you merge with the traffic. They're probably not going to merge with you, particularly if it's a row of semis. I suggest you let them go by and then merge. That's how merging works. And some people do not want their will to merge with God's will. But it's how can God's will be done in our lives if our hearts are not open to Him? Not only that, the fourth thing is you got to have a voice that will lift up Jesus. And you will reach people that nobody else is going to reach. That's what I like about all these different ministries that we're now doing. We want to continue with them even, at, even after we're back in our building. And also when our church has paid off in about eight point something payments, praise God. I actually hadn't mentioned it to anybody much, but I'm thinking about proposing our church begin a half hour broadcast on the local television channel. Uh, because all these different ministries reach different people. And the only way they're going to do that, the only way some people are going to hear about Jesus is if you mention it to them. You ought not to barge in their lives and interrupt their lives and aggravate them and hound them and part, you just keep this up all the time. I tried that when I first got saved. Then I had one guy where I worked with, he said, Dwayne, we're friends, but if you keep this up, we're not going to be. And so I realized that was not working. If something's not working, you may want to try something else. I just prayed is what I did quietly but live tried to live right in front of these people it was, a, it was a challenge but out of that I saw some amazing things take place you got to have a voice that lifts up Jesus and Psalm 40 verse 10 I have not concealed your righteousness within my heart I have proclaimed your faithfulness and your salvation or deliverance I, ha I have not hid away your steadfast love and your truth from the great assembly. This, the psalmist said, I told everybody. I had a voice and I shared it. And I've shared this on these type broadcasts before and heard it all my life since I've been saved. But it's really true. As someone said, you are the only Bible that some people are going to read. That's why you need to live for the Lord. And they do watch you even if you're imperfect. And they can see the difference in your life. And that's what it takes. In John 3.14, this is what Jesus said. Now he's referring to an incident in Numbers 21 where the people of Israel grumbled and they complained. It, they'd had a tough time and they could have took a shortcut. That king of uh, that two different places wouldn't let them go through their land and they had to go around this mountain and the and the soul of the people i think in the king james version it that it was it, it just uh, you know that they just had a terrible time of it so they're complaining and grumbling and and then all of a sudden god sends this plague of poisonous snakes among them a snake bite and you're a dead person okay that's the and they're dying everywhere you can hear people probably crying and screaming in Hebrew, praying in Hebrew, a little bit late, but they were probably praying in Hebrew at that time. But in John 3, 14, Jesus is talking about it. And he says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert on a pole, which he did, it was a bronze serpent, a snake, a picture of a snake. That's why you see it on hospitals and in medical uh, places sometimes. In the Navy, I had a stepfather, and he had one on his sleeve, an emblem, and it's called a caduceus, if I remember correctly. But it was, it was a picture of a snake on a pole. There wasn't two snakes on a the pole. There was just one. But for being able to make it sort of balance out, they used to put two snakes on the pole. But that was the, that's where it came from. It came from this image from Numbers that Jesus is talking about. Just as Jesus lifted up this serpent on a on a uh, in the desert on a pole, so we, uh, excuse me, so it is necessary that the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. It's amazing. In Numbers 21, 8, in the Amplified Bible, Jesus said, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. The serpent wasn't fiery, but make a copy, a bronze image of this snake that has this fiery, poisonous bite that's killing people. And make it out of bronze and set it on a pole and everyone when, when he, who is bitten, when he, we can say, or she looks at it, shall live. 
Let me ask you a question. These people who looked at the snake, was it faith or was it works that caused them to do that? Do you think? My opinion is it was faith because they had to believe God first. But just believing God saying, yeah, I believe it, but they don't look. Then their faith would be worthless. They had to also look at the snake. Then they lived. Faith and works go together. Now, you're not saved by your works, but you're saved to do works if you're saved. And you ought to be doing good works if you're saved. And, and, and here's, here is this psalmist. And he's showing us how, this is how you live for the Lord. And, and the purpose of, of the Word of God, it's like a, a, a seed that you plant that produce a harvest. It's amazing. One ear of corn can produce stalks and stalks of corn that produce ears and ears of corn. Multiplies it. And that's the influence of a godly example. That's the power of the Word of God when it works in your life. And the example that we set that is a godly example is often more powerful than the words that we say. I read a story many, many years ago. It's a, a king who had decided that he would try to help the people in his kingdom be able to be of service better. So he put, had a large boulder set in the middle of the road. And so it was very difficult to go around. People would come to this boulder and they would say some terrible things or grumble about it and go around it. Finally, one man shows up and he decides he will move that boulder. And with a great effort, he moved the boulder off the road. But when he moved it, he saw underneath it was a sack. And in that sack was a, this gold. It was a, a bag of gold. And the king said, I left a note there saying, because you are learning, you have learned how to serve the kingdom, here is your reward. Well, when you learn to serve Christ, there's a much greater reward than a bag of gold. It deals with eternal life. And you have to, to focus on what's most important. I read that Cyrus, who founded the Persian Empire, was so great, kept, he kept, once had captured a prince and his family, and this prince's family, when they came before him, Cyrus said, what will you give me if I release you? He said to this prisoner, this prince. The half of my wealth was the reply. And if I release your children, everything I possess was the reply. And then Cyrus asked this prince who was his prisoner, and if I release your wife? He said, Cyrus said, I mean the prisoner said to, to Cyrus, Your Majesty, I will give myself. Cyrus was so moved by the devotion of this man for his wife and family, he released them all. Later, they were going back to their home, and the prince who was released said, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? And his wife said, I don't know. She said, all I could see was how handsome the one was who would give himself for me. Well, that's what Christ did for you. He loved you even greater than that. He left all that he had in heaven, came to earth, and lived out a sinless, perfect life, the only begotten Son of God, born of a virgin, as a, a Bible prophecy had said, the only one ever. And then was crucified on a cross after being tortured in an illegal trial as a result of that illegal trial. And... Uh, died on this cross, laid his life down for you, and, and all, he did all of that because he loved you that much. I would hope you would think about serving the Lord if you don't serve the Lord. You really need to give your heart and life to Christ. Later on, Jesus, of course, rose from the dead. He already had told his disciples, I've got power to lay my life down and I've got power to take it back up again, and that's what he did. No one took his life for him. He gave it up freely. And he did that because he loved you. And I hope that you would think about loving him as well. We, you and I can't love Christ as much as he loved us because we're imperfect. But that's a great place to start. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God. I pray it would come alive in somebody's heart and life. And that it would produce this harvest, a, a huge harvest. And Lord, as we live out the will of God, we're going to touch people's lives in a way 
that will change their lives forever. It's not really what we do, but it's what you do through us and what you do uh, in the hearts and lives of others. And we thank you for that process, and we're thankful to be part of it and this broadcast being part of it in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And immediately you will see two screens. One's Romans 10, 9, and 10. How to, what believing in, in, in Christ will do within your heart. And then there's the sinner's prayer. If you're not saved, hope you will pray that. We're on Sunday mornings at 11, Wednesdays at 7. We got another a broadcast starting right on Sunday night at 6 p.m. on Sunday night. Hope you'll join us for all of those. God bless you. Hope you have a great week.